Have you ever felt powerless? Do you have a hard time bouncing back from struggles? Do you feel like you're drowning? You must face adversity to become strong, because let's face it, we're all going to have setbacks and difficult situations. The loss of a family member, maybe getting fired from a job, a failed relationship. In this episode, you will learn how to approach those situations with a strong mind, because we all have the capacity to be unbreakable. And you're about to learn how. You can't stop me now, no, you can't. I won't fall no more, no, you can't. You can't stop me now, no, you can't. I won't fall no more, no. The prime factor, I think, or the foundation to mental resilience is adversity. And I'm probably going, you know, in, you know, count, it's counterintuitive probably because most people don't want adversity. They fight adversity. When they have adversity, they feel, why is this happening? I don't want this in my life. I want everything to go very smoothly and I don't want to have any issues. However, adversity tends to be one of the foundations to creating mental resilience. When you face adversity over a consistent period of time, you know how to manage it, how to withstand it. It makes you stronger, it makes you more resilient. In fact, there was a study that was done on dolphins. And there were these dolphins that were in this indoor facility, uh, some type of aquarium. And what they found with these dolphins is that their fins, you know, a dolphin's fin is usually straight mm -hmm. up, they started to kind of flop. And they brought in these scientists and they started looking at the do dolphins and they could not figure out what why the fins were doing this drop. No, normally the fins are, are very rigid and, and sturdy. They looked at the food, they looked at the water in the tank. They could not figure it out until finally what they realized was the fins weren't strong anymore because they were in a tank. And in the water tank that's mm -hmm. isolated, there's no current, there's no pressure, it's not the ocean. And so the, the fins never were never exposed for a long period of time. They were never exposed to the adversity of the ocean, which caused them to be strong. So adversity is actually one of those wonderful things. It's, it's, I love listening to you say this, right? Because it does sound counterintuitive if, you know, someone's hearing that for the first time. If you want to get stronger, you're basically saying, oh, to get stronger, you have to take knocks to the face, left, right and centre. And it doesn't fucking feel good. So now you're saying in this thing that you want to do well at, in this goal that you have, you're going to have to crawl through a pile of shit to get out the end free and strong and, you know, the person you want to be. And it just sounds counterintuitive, but I love the analogy of the fin because it's so true. I actually use the same of the gym. And this was back in the day when I first started learning about growth mindset. So you go to the gym, right? If you only ever lifted five pounds and you only curled five pounds, you're never going to get stronger. So if the goal is to get stronger, what do you have to do? You have to incrementally build up. You can't just go in the gym, right, pick up a 20 pound dumbbell and expect to, to curl it, but you have to pick it up. And what it's doing is micro tears. And so in the micro tears, it's basically telling your body, hey, oh shit, we're not strong here. You've just torn my muscle, but it's a micro tear, so it's not extreme. You've just torn me. I guess I need to get stronger because the next time you pick up that weight, we have to be strong enough to be able to maintain the weight. And it's so freaking powerful. So even though we don't naturally want, and it doesn't feel freaking good to get punched in the face time and time again, um, I love that you've made that analogy to give the example of why when you're in that position where you're actually embracing resilience, how do you self-soothe so that you tell yourself, this is actually good for me? Because most people, right, it's, you want to run in the opposite direction. Well, I think, don't bitch about it. <laughs> I think it's just sometimes, sometimes it's like simple as it's, you know, some things, some, <laughs> sometimes so there's much. like no science, there's nothing really involved. Just don't, just don't bitch about it. Adversity is, is such a great thing to have throughout your life. And again, we don't want to put ourselves in chronic adversity where somebody is chronically doing something to us. That's not what I'm speaking about. I'm speaking about having difficulties throughout life and that when you have them, understand that they help build your mental resilience. There was a study done where they looked at young people, youth, and they did a comparison between youth raised in inner cities, inside the city, which is typically 
rougher versus a suburban area, youths that grew up in a suburban environment where it's super safe, parents really take care of the students, it's a much more coddled environment, protected environment. And what they found when they compared these two groups, that the, the children that were raised, the youths that were raised in an inner city environment actually ended up doing better later on in life. They had better resilience when they mm. were faced with adversity. They actually were more successful in overcoming obstacles in their lives. Whereas this other group struggled quite a bit because they had less adversity. And so when you're facing something, find solace in that this is actually making you a better problem solver, number one, because mm -hmm. when you're dealing with different problems, you become more efficient. Uh, you become almost like a little bit of a chess player and being, okay, I, I see this. Let me see how I'm going to maneuver it. And you learn to withstand things when things happen. They don't completely, they're not all soul crushing. Which normally then when something is soul crushing, it stops you from doing it, obviously doing it again, progressing, trying again. Well, I think people like so focused on, I want to make my life as smooth sails, you know, smooth sailing as possible. Mm. That's never going to happen. No matter how much you try to control every variable in your life, it won't. But if you can just change your mindset to not think of adversity as a problem mm -hmm. or as a negative thing and to think of it as something that is helping you. Like if you think about the whole analogy with the dolphins, they, they lost that strength. Their fins didn't have that because they, they, they no longer had the current of the water, the pressure of the water to create resistance to make it stronger. If there's no resistance. And the example you, the, you gave about working out is exactly that. If there's no resistance, it's not going to get built, come back bitter, um, bigger, better, and stronger. Mm. Wow, I love that. Have, did you have an example where you had to, in that moment, where you were, let's say, facing adversity and it really freaking sucked and most people would just like run in the opposite direction? Like when you first started joining the training, like that was so freaking intense. I mean, you must have been exhausted, like to the point where you can even open your eyes by the end of the day. Um, are there moments where you you literally are being physically and mentally pushed to your freaking limits on a daily basis? So at the end of those, how many people quit? I'm sure a lot. A lot. How, quit. how did you not quit, Evie? How did you have that mental resilience in that moment where you're like, this resistance is going to make me stronger? I think perhaps maybe I grew up with a lot of struggles immigrant family, poor neighborhood. We, we lived in poor economic environment, government housing, rats, cockroaches. My father though was quite resilient and very much a fighter and a pushback. He never let me moan and bitch. And maybe that was it. My parents actually did not entertain it growing up. So I can't really say it's, I can't really say the Secret Service did this to me. My family just, they, this just there was no room for it. Mm. They also didn't grow up like that because if they, did they'd starve? They would have, they would have, they would have never survived. And so there was that mindset in my house. It's like you don't bitch. You you make things happen. You have a problem, find a solution. Mm. I never got. Oh my God, you poor thing. I never got that. Mm. I never got that. And I think maybe it normalized adversity for me, so that when it happened, it wasn't like oh my God, I can't believe this is happening to you. It was like, it's life. Suck it up. That really maybe trained me and made me understand so when things did come, I wasn't completely f annihilated by them, perhaps. And that's the thing, right? That some people do, and I get it, right? Maybe they've been taught in the past, maybe their childhood where, you know, the adversity never got them stronger because they didn't have the capabilities or they weren't around people, in, you know, whatever situation. And so I just want to try to encourage people to lean into the adversity, some, obviously depending on what it is and in today's world, that can mean many different things. But in our context, let's take Quest as a perfect example. When I first started, I was in the shipping department. I had no idea what I was doing. I had been basically the boss of my two dogs. I was shipping Quest bars from my living room floor. And that was about as far as my experience had gone. And then Quest grew at 57,000% you're freaking thrown into the deep end. It's like, no, 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 no. If you don't keep up, you lose your house. If this doesn't happen, then you lose your house. So every time I faced a moment of adversity where I'm like, I'm not good enough, oh my God, like I was struggling, getting pushed back. I, I, if I didn't have my house, I may have quit. Like I may have been like, well, this freaking sucks. Like this almost because I didn't see that it would lead to somewhere great. I just thought that the, the pushback and the adversity just will keep going. 
So I think that the threat of losing my house gave me the, the, um, the strength to keep going. Now, in hindsight, I realized that that's exactly what helped me build my mental resilience, is the fact that every time I fell down, I had to get back up. Every time I fell back down, I had to keep pushing. So even if I had, in, you know, um, if we keep with the metaphor of the muscles, if I had torn the muscle, I didn't let that stop me. I still showed up the next day. But that's all in hindsight. So I go, how do we help the people that right now may be feeling the, 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 um, the adversity, but don't know how to emotionally keep pushing themselves so that they can actually realize what you're saying is true. Because I do believe proof is in the pudding. You do it once, right? It becomes, oh, all right. Now at least I've got this to go back to the next time it feels shitty. I'm going to remind myself of the thing before that. But how do they get the first one? Because their instinct is to run in the other direction. All right, so I think what you're trying to get at, there's two different things, right? There's trauma and there's adversity. We're not speaking about somebody who's been through a traumatic event. Hmm. Sometimes trauma can require a lot more work and require therapy. Sure. So I want to make sure like if somebody's been through something traumatic, not that they can't overcome it, they can, but I think we're speaking about adversity and life obstacles in a sense. And that's to some point when things do happen, right? We want to be able to not, at least for me, I try not to stay in that place of sorrow and of pity and of feeling bad for myself and try to, I guess, embrace or maybe have a cup of coffee, as you say, with whatever bad is, you know, or whatever negative thing is happening. And maybe not trying to see it as a negative thing, but as just something that's going to inevitably happen. Mm. I think I had shared this once before, but like I, I really did come from my parents, and especially my dad, who always kind of was like push, push, move. Like he was kind of like a beast. Like he was always in beast mode. And I remember when he was, he was dying of cancer. And I remember I was doing my best to maintain his treatment, but he had pancreatic cancer, which was extremely painful. And it just came to the point where we had hospice at home, but I, I couldn't manage it. I just, I couldn't manage his pain. I couldn't do it. And he really needed to be hospitalized. And we finally, you know, hospice came, the people that would come every day. And they're like, he has to go in. And there was this understanding that I knew that once he went in, he was never coming back. And I remember, I remember when it was happening and I started to tear up. Meanwhile, he's dying. And he says to me, he like slaps me in the back of me. He says, yeah. And he says to me in Greek, he says, which translates to like, hey, how are we going to win the war if you behave, if you act like this? And I was like, he's dying. And he's like, hey, we got to move, move forward. And it stayed with me. But he was always like that in his life. So I guess like when you see that and when you have examples of that in your life, I think that's key. And I think maybe being around people who, who deal with adversity well, right? If I'm around other people who don't manage it well, who avoid it, um, who maybe don't go into, into it, then I'm going to do the same thing. But if I'm around other brave people, strong people, people who see adversity as a challenge rather as like, oh my God, like knocking you down, then I'm going to manage it that way. Now it's your turn to talk. Yeah, girl, that was so fucking beautiful. Um, thank you for being raw and honest. And I think it's important for people to see as well. You know, I know you said you've never cried on camera before, but um, I, I just feel like that's what we're doing here. It's not to pretend, like I'm not here to pretend and, you know, to be something I not, I'm not. And I know you aren't either. We want to be honest and truthful and real. And that's what we're doing. It literally, without meaning to, was the perfect example of you embracing adversity. Yes, because I hate crying. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like not me. It's not it's not my space. It's not. It's just not. But you know, like it's my father. It's someone I loved. And there's no it's one of the deepest and if for someone who's lost someone they love, it's one of the deepest pains you can feel. It, often I give that people the advice and like find that whatever you experience and see if you can. It's not for everybody but maybe be, give back to that community of people. And now one, you don't feel like you're alone mm. because often when we go through something, we feel alone and isolated. You don't feel alone. There's a community there that exists. You can be part of that community, you embrace it. And then now you're helping other people going through this. And you know what that does now? It shifts you and it makes you more powerful. Mm -hmm. That's so true. So um, I had a guest on um, the show a while ago. Her, her name's Amanda Nien and she had been raped in college. And after that, she took her voice and went to Congress. And she was like, I need to pass laws, make sure that this never happens to anyone again on college campus. And she's literally dedicated her life to changing um, laws in Congress. And she's been a part of, it's something like 16 different laws in like a space of like, um, I don't know, five years or something like that, that she's had impact on. And when I think about exactly what you said on how she's used that and look, I, I cannot even imagine what it's like. So I never even want to pretend um, of what it's like to be in her situation to be to have that happen to you. So I don't even want to pretend. But the fact that she took that and empowered herself, right? You even just said she she made herself more powerful by that and is now not just impacting herself. She's literally impacting freaking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of women in the United States alone. Yeah, so she just flipped it. She made it from, yes, yeah, something bad happened to you, something painful happened to you, but then she took her power back and now she's using that to change the world. If you can look at adversity, not as a negative thing, but as a challenge, I look at it and I think, how can I work around this. And I was able to take that negative part out, that when something comes up to look at it as it's a horrible thing, as a bad thing, and shift it into, okay, well, one, I know these things are gonna happen. And two, how can I make this work? And if we live in the truth of things, of what is real, when these things happen, they will, hurt as much, they won't be as painful. And truly, the more of these you have in your life, the more resilient you'll become and the less they're gonna affect you. I honestly couldn't imagine putting myself in your shoes and understanding what you're going through. I, I couldn't. I have my own life, I've got my own perspective, my own experiences. So I honestly don't even try to pretend that I know the struggles that you are going through. But the one thing I can say is it's okay. It's okay, however you're feeling right now, give yourself grace. Give yourself grace that you may be struggling because at the end of the day, you're gonna come through it. Like you really will. It's just gonna take time. It's gonna take some effort. It's gonna take some work. But like seriously, you can come through it. But for now, just give yourself grace. I'm not alone. You're not alone. None of us are alone. As a girl, I really did feel like very insecure. Um, you know, I was teased for my look, so I really believed it when people said, you know, I wasn't pretty and I was dumb. And um, the one thing I held on to was my art because that was the only thing that I was actually ever getting a pat on the back for. But growing up, I definitely had that weak mentality. And I used to look for other people to make me feel stronger. So even with my husband, God bless him, but it was like, I was waiting for him to make me feel a certain way. If I did something that was great, he would, you know, pat me on the back and that would build my confidence, if you will. And then, so for me, it was very much, I had to get my mind strong. Like that was the key thing. How do I get my mind strong? And so it was things that we just spoke about is facing things that are difficult. Um, 
But for me also, it was making sure that actually I take ownership over what, how I act and how I show up in the world. So if I showed up in a meeting or in, on a date or whatever, and I wasn't confident or I felt weak, once I said, okay, if you feel weak, it is your responsibility to get yourself to feel stronger. The second I said, it is your responsibility with anything in life, like every time I started to face things, that was when things started to change for me. That is when I started to realize, oh, if I don't take this chance, then I'm going to stay where I am. But if I do, if I fall on the floor, then it's up to me to then get back up. And once I started to do that with my health, because I had massive gut issues, I started to feel stronger. I started to feel like I wasn't listening or waiting for the doctors to fix me. Because that was it. That puts you in a very weak spot when you're waiting for someone else to come and make you feel stronger about yourself. Or when you blame other people for everything that's going yeah. on. Hmm. And that's like, that's a red flag. Like when you hear someone, or even if you hear yourself and you're starting to blame things that are happening in your life and problems that are arising, and you're like, well, if this person didn't do this, mm -hmm. if that person, well, so-and-so was late, where this person didn't do this, well, oh my God, he ruined my life or she ruined my life. This person's torturing me. Mm. Uh, if, if I didn't just, you know, if I didn't have this issue, if I didn't have that, when that's a recurring theme, you're in a completely powerless mindset. Mm. You are the recipient of whatever life is doing to you. You are, you are, you are affected. You are not affecting the world. The mm. world is only affecting you. And so you're just absorbing everything, but you're not putting anything back out there. And I feel like the, there has to be a back and forth with, not just with people, but with the world. So what are you putting out there? Because if, if you bitch and moan and I, okay. One, you're not resolving anything. Two, people are gonna get tired of listening to you. No matter, no matter how difficult what you've been through is, like you have to at some point move on and you can choose not to move on, but there is a point, there's an expiration date for that narrative that you've created. And if you find yourself saying that narrative for an extended period of time, now this is, now it's you. I literally was gonna ask you how, where, at what point do you think of it as like, taking actual ownership and then like, there's no ownership to take because it's not your fault, right? Because that's what I think people say is like, oh, it's not my fault. Where, do you have a fine line? Uh, even the word control is something that I speak a lot about with a lot of women. Some people think, no, 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 by saying you can control things, you're actually setting yourself up for disaster. And now a lot of people are saying, you know, no, you should embrace it. You can't control things. Um, how do, you, how do you feel about that? Where does that sit with you? Well, you can't control any, everything. You try to set up a plan. You try to deal with all the different variables. So when I would do, for example, the security for the president of the United States, I would put a, a, a really good plan together. I, I, I tried to control as much as I could, but I can't control everything. I was competent. I was efficient. I did what I needed to do, but I was not delusional to think that nothing could ever happen to mm. him. So there's that difference. So I... Ex I tried to control what I could, but I also accepted the vulnerability of it. With that understanding, I could be adaptable. We were adaptable. So when it happened, it wasn't like, oh my God, I can't believe this just happened. I, mm. I checked all these boxes, it can't be happening. I, there was no time for that dialogue. There was a mindset or a plan in place of, uh, that you would take ownership for when those vulnerabilities penetrated you, right? So look, do we want mental resilience? Do we want to keep stuff out, the negativity, the chatter, the bad people? Yes. We try to do that the best we can. We try to control that. But there's moments where you're going to miss it. It's going to come through, mm -hmm. right? And then you think, okay, how do I now withstand that? Or how do I adapt mm -hmm. to that? And that is the way the security plans went. Everybody knew shit could break bad at any moment. We were prepared for it. So when it broke bad, we weren't all sitting there like, can you believe this? Right. Oh my God, whose fault is this? Yes. Who dropped the ball? It, that probably would come later for sure. But everybody was quick to adapt. Okay, let's take ownership of the situation. What do we do? Where do we go? So that's a very quick example or a quick time frame there where you really don't have time to sit and process something. You have to immediately go from problem to immediately to the solution mm -hmm. mindset, like to creating a solution. It's when we live in a problem and we tell ourselves that problem over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And we just live in this narrative how are you moving forward? You're not progressing because you're still in the past talking about what happened to you or what's happened to you. And 
you're in a problem mindset where you're just ruminating over the issue. What you want to be able to do is shift from a problem narrative, that narrative, like, I can't believe this, this is so upsetting, to being able to move into a powerful mindset where now you're in a solution state. Okay, I know this happened to me. I know it sucked. I know it was horrible. I know it was painful. But now how do I resolve this? Like, where, what are my avenues and where I can progress from here? Not from where I was, not from where I wish to be or where I wish I was, but from where I am. So part of it is live in the reality of where you are, and that's mental resilience. You know, take off those rose, those pink, pink or rose colored, colored glasses, right? But just see it for what it is, under, accept it for what it is. And I think acceptance is also key, accepting the shitty situation you're in. And, and you can feel it. I think it's okay to feel it, let it live in you for a little bit, but it's not, it's not the type of environment you want to make your home all year round. That's where you, you will literally make yourself sick in probably any, every sense of the, the word. The yeah, word. when I was sick for, you know, over a year, I was literally, so massive gut issues, felt like my gut completely erupted, could barely breathe, barely stand up. Um, I put pepper on my, literally put pepper on my food. Um, and Tom almost had to rush me to the emergency room because it, it ar aggravated my gut that much. It like had knotted up. So I was very extremely malnutritioned for over a year. Um, and I was just fucking waiting for doctors to fix me. Like, you want to talk about giving your power over? I gave my power over because I thought it was, it was almost like, no, 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 help me, help me. I I thought that was the right thing that would make me feel better, right? Like, oh, well, it's someone else, they're gonna fix me. And I just kept waiting, girl. I kept waiting. And every time the doctor would say something, I was like, but my, it doesn't sound right. And I never freaking listened to my own body. Like literally, I'm listening to all these professionals. I'm listening to all these people who have degrees, you know, and have like the wonderful office in Beverly Hills. So I was like, oh, of course they're gonna know how to fix me. And I just gave my power over. And after a year where I still couldn't wear a bra, I wasn't feeling sexy, you know, like all these things that were really affecting my feminine feeling and like the woman I wanted to be, it really affected me. And then after a year, it was like, what if this is all my fault? Now, a lot of people hate the word fault. I love the word fault. So I'm going to use the word fault. But if you don't like the word fault, please, please exchange that for responsibility, taking my power back, whatever. So I was like, oh, it's all my fault. If this is all my fault, what would I do differently next time? And even just in thinking like that, right, what would I do differently? How could this be the best thing that's ever happened to you? How can you use this as the most empowering freaking thing ever? And by that one thought, girl, I stopped waiting for doctors. I started to listen to my body. I was like, hang on a minute. I haven't had a period for like 10 years. Hang on a minute. I, you know, like, and I started pu pulling all these things together. My hormones are out of whack. I've got this like aura ring and it's telling me I'm not sleeping. Does that have anything to do with my, right? And I just took freaking ownership. And I said, if this was my fault, how can I take the power back? And it was, find out who you are, Lisa. Start listening to your body. No one knows your body like you do. Cool, so now I'm just gonna take ownership. Body, what are you trying to tell me, right? And then starting to give myself space to say, if it was my fault, I'm gonna use, keep using that word. If it was my fault, then it means I have the power to do something about it. If it's someone else's fault, then I'm waiting for someone else to fix me. Yes, I get that. When you when you are waiting for somebody else to come in and fix this for me, you're, you're at the mercy of that person coming in and fixing it yeah. for you. And you're making this assumption that that person or this outside entity cares more about you than you do. Mm -hmm. Or knows you better than you do, right? Right, but it's like, it's me, it's my body, my life, my, my everything. So if it's not to the standard that I want it to be, why am I looking outside of myself to have that person change it? Mm -hmm. It always starts with me. I think the one exception that exists where it's hard to take harder to take ownership is when somebody's young, when they're a child because they are dependent on their family. They are dependent on a parent or a guardian for survival. Um, but then it does hit a point where like now you can take ownership and you can make those changes in your life over time. I think that's really truly the one exception where it's hard to take ownership. You may want to, but it's like I'm 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 waiting my survival is based on somebody else. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I'm sure right now people are freaking hammering in the YouTube comments, but what about this situation? How can it be my fault? Like, I get there's going to be certain situations that I just haven't experienced, so I can only be talking from my point. But that thought, girl, the fact that I discovered that idea with my health, I took ownership, I started to do my own tests, get them together, I started to try different things, I started to um, go, even if society says this is crazy, I'm gonna do it and just listen to my body. And when I took ownership over my health, it spilled into everything. It spilled into my relationship with my husband, take ownership if we have an argument, instead of going, he did this, he did that, he snapped at me, he was moody, He. No, 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 Lisa, what did you do as part of this? He may have been moody, but if he was moody, did you engage him? Did you press his button? Did you know he was moody and you kept going? Right? All of this shit where I'm like, take ownership, take ownership, has changed my life. Same with business, right? It's like, if a deal doesn't come through, all right, well, what, what was my part in it that I can now use as power for next time? And when I say power, I mean power within myself. And so I love everything comes back to really what you said at the beginning is don't give your power away. I think I, 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 I totally agree with you. And then I, I've always kind of lived in this mindset of like, don't bitch, mm. don't bitch mindset. Nobody wants to be around that. I'm never going to get better if I keep bitching. And I remember this scenario where, and there's multiple scenarios, but I did learn truly in the service as well about taking ownership and accountability. The president was going somewhere to a campus to speak. I was the agent in charge of the overall everything. And so as the, cha the agent, uh, you call the lead, it's called the lead agent. I was the agent in charge of the whole thing, so all the different components. And I had other agents who were handling the different parts. So people are reporting to me, but I'm the hub, right? I would be the lead. So the, so to speak, almost like the supervisor of this event. And so I had an agent that's called a site agent, and that means that agent's responsible for that site. So I show up, we walk through the area, and I was like, he's telling me, okay, the staff is saying they're gonna put the stage here, this and that, he's walking me through, and I said, okay, everything looks fine, just make sure, two ways in, two ways out. You understand, there's thousands of people, if something happens, one way gets blocked, I need another way to get them out. He's like, well, the, you know, the staff kind of pushed back on that. They won this and that. I said, that's not something you, we, you know, you compromise with a lot of different things. That's, that's something we don't compromise with. It's not a with. debate. That's not a debate. Make it happen. So the morning shows up. Get the president. Get everybody. We go to the event. One way in, <gasps> one way out. <laughs> I'm just like, there's nothing I can do. So I'm just, you know, you're having this moment of like, I hope nothing bad happens. My supervisors now see this, you mm -hmm. know, and I know I'm like, I'm, there's, there's not, I'm going to get chewed out. So the president does his thing. He survives. Thank God. He leaves. We're in the motorcade going back to the White House. My supervisor calls me as we're driving back. Pomparis, I need to see you immediately at the White House as soon as we get back. Yes, sir. He's like, bring your side agent. Yes, sir. <laughs> Call up my side agent. I'm not happy to talk to this person. Hey, boss need you in the office, meet us now. We both show up and the boss chooses out, rightfully so. Because it's a very fundamental thing like that happened. Like this just that's something that, it's just like protection 101. Right. And, but he chews me out. Mm -hmm. My side agent says nothing. He doesn't even look at my side agent, says nothing to my side agent. I get the dress down from top to bottom. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. It will never happen again, sir. We leave. I say nothing to my side agent. I say nothing to the boss. I'm like, well, it's this motherfucker's fault. <laughs> right. Because he doesn't want to hear that. Yeah. I was in charge. It was my event. It was my everything. I was the heavy. It lands on me. So I just took it. Now, if I would have sat there, but sir, do you know what he did? He would have lost all respect for me. I would have lost all credibility. And in his, in his eyes, it's like, that's not what leaders do. And so when you're in these leadership positions, you just take ownership. So it's kind of like, I'm the leader in my life. I guess I, I apply it to everything. I'm the leader in my life. So I got to take ownership. And if, it's, if I don't like it, I have to somehow thoughtfully do an assessment of whatever the, is going on and then think about how I'm going to course correct. Mm -hmm. 
And that's the thing that I love every time you talk and you tell stories. It's always about course correcting, right? It's never about yeah. beat myself up that I did this and I made a mistake. And like, I think that that's a massive reason of how you've actually built your own mental resilience is, is not beating yourself up. And that's, I think, where p people get stuck in when we say, or at least for me, when I say take ownership, everything's your fault, it usually becomes that like, how do they keep going? Because that normally stops them. But for you, it's looking at it and going, all right, cool. This was, you know, my fault or whatever word you want to use. I take ownership. How do I course correct? And that, like, la literally that sentence, I think, takes someone from feeling powerless to powerful within themselves. Yeah, I, I can see. I think maybe a big part of it is ego. I always try to keep my ego in yes. check. And so when I sit there and I, and I just create this grandiose story and what's happening to me in my life and this person's doing this and that's happening to me, that's me living in this egocentric world. And it's kind of like having a moment where it's just, just kind of getting that slap over the head and just be like, you know what? You're one out of billions. Mm -hmm. And just, it's not that big a deal. But it's so true about ego. I'm so glad that you brought that up because it really is. It goes back to fault, right? Usually when people say it's your fault, like it's your fault, Evie, it's made as an insult. It's perceived as that means you're bad. That means that you're no good, right? Some people perceive it. So they try to, um, which I get, like protect your self-esteem. And I was the same girl. Like I didn't want to feel bad. I already felt badly about myself. Like the last thing I wanted was to feel more badly about myself. So at the time when I was younger, if someone had said to me, no, 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 you need to take ownership. You need to say, this is all your fault. I'd be like, are you freaking crazy? Like this could break me. I'm already struggling with my own self-esteem and ego. So now if you're saying, take it, it's my fault. Like you're just actually breaking me. And that's why I love how I think now and how I've been able to swap it out. But that's why I want to emphasize it's not fault. But taking that and saying, hey, give me more powerful. Okay, so, because you keep bringing up faults and I know you're so, you're so good, you always want to think of other people and think about their perception of it. Here's the thing, that language works for you. Correct. That's it. So before anybody judges, anybody throws hate, that's the language, whatever reason, that word causes a trigger reaction for you that allows you to take accountability. That's it, that works for you. Mm -hmm. Now, for someone else, that word could really annihilate them, crush their self-esteem. Exactly. Maybe they grew up having somebody tell them they're, they're, this is your fault, anything bad happens, this is your fault. You know, uh, abusive relationships when your partner says, well, it's your fault. If you didn't do this, I wouldn't have had to do this to you, oh, right? Oh, that's, I never dawned on me, you're So language is important. So you have to pick the language that works for you. So for me, fault, it doesn't really work for me. Mm, what, what do you use? Just own it. I'm, I'm just, I'm probably, I'm probably a little bit primitive in my head, probably. <laughs> you like, own it? A little bit of a Neanderthal, like, stop bitching, fucking figure it out. I, I, you know what I do at night, though, that helps me at night? I write down, I do like very bullet point things. I'm not a big journal person. I'll do like, I'll write like three things I'm grateful for to help me practice gratitude because sometimes I can get into that bitch, 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 bitch <laughs> space. Yeah. I'll write down things that, um, the three things I want to do tomorrow. That's something that helps me stay task oriented. But the one thing I do that I realize also really helps me is I will write down three things that I could have done better today. Mm. And so if I happen to go to Dunkin' Donuts that morning and, you know, get myself some donuts, I'll write down no donut. You know, I had donuts this morning. It can also be something as I shouldn't have yelled at this person, which if you know me, sometimes that can happen. But so it just allows me to take ownership of my, of my day mm -hmm. the next day. As you were saying it, it's actually I love doing this because I get more of an insight into myself. I only say for in certain situations. You're right. Like, if it's like, for instance, I pull my back out <laughs> and I'm like, it's your freaking fault, Lisa. Yes, you walk into the gym and you think you're a freaking beast. What do you expect if you pick up a hundred pounds without warming up? It's your freaking fault. Yes. Like that, I need to say that. I can't be like, Lisa, it's okay. Like you can do better next. Like it doesn't work. I need to say, what the fuck? That's your fault. Almost like the stop bitching, like it's that. But there are certain situations and I have to really think about, maybe if, it's, if I'm sensitive or emotional about something, because let's say it's, with work and I haven't shown up, whether it's in a team meeting or an interaction with someone or a project or whatever, let's say I've shown up and I haven't, I've known I could have done better as a leader or, you know, as a teammate. 
I won't beat myself up because in those, in those moments, and I actually won't say four either, in those moments, I'm a little sensitive because I so want to um, do a good job. Like my heart so wants to. So in those moments, actually, I do say, what can you learn from this and what can you do differently next time? No. When my health went utterly to I finally started to realize I had to take ownership. I was waiting for people to fix me. I was waiting for the doctors to fix me. And then I realized, hang on, if I took ownership over it, if I can actually say I got myself into this, could that potentially mean that I could get myself out of it? And yes, the second I took ownership, I realized that I could actually start to fix myself. So what I started to do is take full ownership of my health, of my lifestyle. I started to take sleep really freaking seriously. I also took utter ownership over the food and the supplements and my diet and making sure that I was taking the right nutrients in order to fuel myself. So guys, right now you need to ask yourself, what is the thing you're struggling with? And how can you take utter ownership over it in order to actually live the life you want? Now, go do it. I use disruptors and it's something that I began using years ago because I found myself to be that person, yes I am that person, who would get into her head and I would um, blame, I would get angry and even if I didn't verbalize it internally, I would, I would have that conversation kind of on repeat, you know, mm -hmm. the CDs playing the same song over and over and over and over again. So if you find yourself if you find yourself with your CD on repeat or that same song, you need a disruptor. You mm -hmm. need to kind of change yourself. When I deal with adversity, or probably more like uh, difficult people. So if you're dealing with people that are affecting you in a negative way, right? You're getting into a heated argument, somebody's doing something to you, and you are in a moment where nothing good's gonna come out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. I strongly encourage you not to bite back because when we speak from emotion, we just speak from emotion and we hit hard. We throw these zingers out there to people and once you put it out there, you can never get it back. Mm -hmm. One disruptor I use is distance. I will put distance between myself and the problem. So if it's a person, I will literally make distance. I'll leave a room. <laughs> yeah, me too. I will walk out, I will leave the room. Um, if it's a situation, I will remove myself from the situation. And sometimes distance is just going out and getting a, a cup of coffee and then coming back to your office desk. Mm. Or sometimes distance is, depending on the issue, is you know, going backpacking in Europe for a month. <laughs> Whatever it is that you That's need. Quite a dramatic disruptor, right? Hey man, there. Everyone's got everyone's <laughs> got a different load they have to carry. Everyone's got a burden. And based on what your burden is. And what you need. Mm. It's also what do I need? Mm -hmm. And so I can get over something like 10 minutes later, I'm like, look, I'm fine. And somebody else may need five days. We're all different. So it's really knowing who you are. So distance is good. Time is good. So time is literally just not speaking to somebody for a certain period of time, avoiding messages, texts, all that stuff. Just don't do it. Don't write it. Don't text it. Don't send it. Don't photograph it. Don't just don't do any of those things because again, once it's out there, you can never take it back. And especially if it's in text, you don't know who's gonna forward it, copy it, send it, post it. So just be mindful of that. I, I strongly encourage people just put time so that when you are responding to someone, you've had time to think about what you're gonna write and you're just not responding because you're pissed off and your ego is bruised. Yeah, God, it reminds me of this one quote. I actually just posted it. It was like, don't make a permanent decision on a temporary emotion. Yeah. It's, you're emotional. And think of those moments of when you've done that and then afterward you regret it. Oh, yeah. And you're like, you know, that didn't make me look good. I looked weak. I, I, I fell into this person's trap. And if you think of it this way, you're here. You're trying to be here. This person's here. So when you do that, you know what you're doing? You're coming here to meet them. Never, not once, has everyone, anyone ever been like said, I'm so glad that I said that. Like in that heat of the moment, I'm so glad, that, no one, right? Most of the time, maybe some people <laughs> are just like, okay, I said it. Um, but most people after will regret the emotional response that they've had. And so I try to remind myself of that in the moment. 
I don't have to lose my professionalism just because you do. I don't have to drop down to meet you here, but I will address you. Mm. And so you can address people and check people or put people in their place because you, you absolutely need to do that from time to time. You do, but they're rare moments. But overall, you need time and you need to let your emotions run their course before you do that. I actually learned the disruptor thing through not using the disruptor. So my ex-boyfriend, it was like, you just hours and hours and hours of screaming matches and making each other feel bad. And it doesn't end well and it just keeps escalating. As it keeps escalating, I noticed that as it escalates, words become more powerful. And he started to use more words like, oh, I didn't get her with that. So let me throw this at her. Oh, I didn't. It was like he was looking to get me to spill over, right? Like to push me over the edge. And so he would use words to weaponize, like my um, things he knew about me, my insecurities, he would use it to weaponize. Um, or he weaponized it, I should say. And so as I grew older, I was like, okay, how do I ever avoid getting in that situation again? And going back to what we're saying about ownership, it's like, I'm the same. I, it, I can't control someone else. I can't control how you act towards me, right? You could have every choice to scream and shout at me for no reason, and you can't, but I can control how I show up and react to it. And that was when I started to take ownership of being the second half, right? It's not just that he's shouting at me, it's that I'm shouting back. It's that I'm not walking away. It's that I'm I'm entertaining his- um, Antics. Antics, yeah. yeah. And that's when I started going, okay, walk away. But then I started to walk away with Tom and I realized, oh, it's not just walking away, it's what you do when you walk away. Because the first thing I started doing is you go bitch and moan to someone else about your partner. And that to me is just feeding into the feeling that you already have. It's not actually helping. The whole point of the disruptor is to, like you said, come back down to normal emotionally. It's interesting because I won't bitch and moan to someone else, but I'll stew. But I'll blast my music. I do things to change whatever's going on in my, my brain. Like the chemistry, the the neurology, whatever's happening, I'm like, I have to switch it. And I will listen to loud music. I'll put on a book that changes my demeanor. I'll watch a movie. I'll leave. I'll drive all the way to the beach. And then just that time and just use it to reflect. But with my partner, I'll have this internal dialogue. Like he's a good person that you don't, he loves you. He's, he's not these negative things you're arguing about something, whatever it is. You didn't take out the trash. You're supposed to take out the trash every Friday. That's something you should do. Um, and instead of get mad at him for that, I'll think, well, maybe I should help out and take the trash when he forgets. But there's moments where I'll, I'll, I'll come back when I'm calm and I'll sit down. I'm like, look, I'm sorry we argued. This is, this is what's going on. This is what bothered, bothers me. And if there's something that he does, I'll say, could you correct this behavior? Now I can do that with him. Mm -hmm. You can't do that with everybody. Right. You can't sit everybody down. You can't sit down friends. Maybe some you can. You can't sit down employees, colleagues, bosses, supervisors. You can't do that with all, all people. So with the partner thing though, I love that you said, you know, I know him. I do that too, girl. Like it, I know my emotions are temporary. Like literally, what can I do to change the chemicals that I'm feeling? Because right now I feel shitty. And that's what I was saying. Originally when, um, you know, when I was much younger, I would like bitch and moan. I thought, oh, I'm gonna get it out, right? It just helps if you just tell someone else how you feel and you're good to go. The problem I notice is it just feeds into it, especially depending on who you go to. People have those friends and guys, I'm staring at you in the camera. You know your friends. You know the people that you're going to turn to that they turn around and they, they know they're going to help them feed into the, the feeling. I can't fucking believe that bastard did it. I told you to leave him a long time ago, right? You know those friends that are going to be like, yeah, yeah, you, you should be mad. And that's when I'm like, oh, that doesn't serve me. So why do I call the people that are feeding into a feeling that I'm trying to let go of? So that's when I started to change it and go, okay, Lisa, this is your emotion, step away, but what are you doing when you step away? And that's where I'm like, there usually are two things. It's either I need to calm myself, so I need to like deep breath, which is usually like um, either go outside, like what you were saying, or listen to music. Music is so freaking powerful. Um, but if it's 
almost like an anxiety, like a, um, a build-up of energy, and I don't know how to let it out. I'll freaking hit the gym, girl. Pump those weights, listen to Tupac hardcore, get me the iron, me against the weights. And I've, I've pushed out all the aggression. Once I've pushed out the aggression, then I can kind of come back. My emotion is no longer blinding me to the real situation. And then I can address the real situation. And that real situation means, oh, he bit my head off. I didn't like that he used that word. He actually said this that rubbed me the wrong way. And then I can come back like what you were saying and sit down and go, hey, I didn't like it when you said this. I don't like this. Or I'm sorry, I was oversensitive. Like, I will also say that. Like, I realized that you just triggered me. Um, and the trigger is on my part, it's not you, but you did trigger me. So if you can actually help me not say this and not do this, and that actually builds up our relationship even more. Yes, for you have the ability to do that, which is a blessing. One of the things you did when you talked about going to the gym, so you use your environment as a disruptor. Mm -hmm. So changing your environment. So we have time, mm -hmm. which is chronological time, distance, physical distance, leaving an area, going on vacation, doing whatever you need to do, or just leaving the, the office, the room, the bedroom, whatever it is, and then changing your environment, which is going to the gym, yeah. right? You're, you're trying to do that. And those are all great disruptors. And I think they're different for each people. Each person has to stop and think, what's a great disruptor for me? Mm -hmm. One thing that I used to love, one of my favorite disruptors was going to the movies. When you go to the movies, you're, you're so overstimulated. The loud sound, you get lost in the movie. It's this big screen. I've got my popcorn and my Pepsi and I'm really in it and I get lost and I forget where I, I was and in this moment I go somewhere else and then when I'm done I'm like, oh, and now I'm almost in a different mindset. So that was a wonderful disruptor for me. Working out is a great disruptor. Running is a great disruptor. Martial arts, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I use that from time to time. That's a great disruptor. Mm -hmm. So it is unique for each person. Mm -hmm. But it's also, but I think the biggest thing is recognizing when you're doing this and also recognizing, I think, it's not okay to be vicious and mean yeah. to people. And it takes a lot of work to control that. It, it, it's easy to like lash out and, 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 and rip somebody and shred them. It is not mm -hmm. easy to control it. Even more so in your relationship, because you know their soft spots, you know their yeah. hot points, you know where they're weak, you know where they're insecure. And that, you know, really ties into, because in a relationship, I'm always saying, you know, be yourself, be honest, trust that person, be open. But you are then putting yourself at risk for these moments where that person can use that against you. And in those moments when someone's hurt you, you want to hurt them back. Like, it's almost just yes. human nature. You don't you don't want to hurt them. It's your them. ego. It's your ego, yeah. Um, I'm going to check you. Yeah. And girl, like, you've even said you can't fucking take shit back. Like, honestly, especially when it comes to a relationship, you can't take shit back. And I'm so hyper aware of that, like, from day one with Tom and I. Um, so our, one of our biggest things is don't weaponize the other person's insecurities. And that's where the disruptors to me really came in use because I know my instinctualness to right, go into something, to protect myself, to defend myself, especially because I had my ex-boyfriend that was just cruel and mean. So I had learned to stand up for myself, to like keep my wall up. I got my shit. You can't penetrate me. You can't hurt me. And this doesn't lead to a successful relationship if I do this. So the disruptors to me were the solution. But going to what you were saying even about movies, knowing what your freaking disruptor is and what emotion you're trying to change. Because I did the disruptor initially and I was making it worse because I was going to the people that only fed the emotion that I was in. But I think if you can assess what emotion am I trying to get, how do I shift it? And then what is that for me so that I can go to this as like a cheat sheet? Yeah. One of the great things with disruptors is it just gives you clarity. Right, yes. You're trying to get clarity. So you're, 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 you're seeing red, you're angry, or you're sad, or you're crying, or you're, your voice is stifled. It, different people manifest in different ways. You and I are very assertive women. Some other individuals are not as assertive. Some, a lot of other people swallow how they feel. They don't express themselves. They, they, they allow the other person to always be the dominant and to avoid conflict, they will go along with what that other person wants them to do to mm. keep peace. And that, that's also very, a very unhealthy place to live. And using disruptors to step away sometimes and 
or even distance to look to look back at a relationship or a person and think like did this person make me feel good about myself so sometimes it's not about being hot-headed sometimes it's like some people are are cruel man they, they can give you a beating you can take a beating and take a beating from not just a partner but a family member a, a boss this one woman I remember reached out to me she had a supervisor that was just so just so crushing for her she would go home and all she thought about was her supervisor all she could talk about was how vicious and cruel her supervisor was and she's like what do I do can you give me tactics to deal with her and mm. I said stop dealing with her mm. so the first thing is stop, stop entertaining it but she kept pushing back and so it's like if you engage with every fool you deal with you become as predictable as that fool mm. stop responding to everything stop responding to every everyone when you can identify this is not someone I should respond to this person is chaotic this person is a mess this person is really not that relevant and with her look it was a supervisor but I kept telling her stop pushing back the more you push back and challenge them the worse it becomes for you just leave it do your job focus on that and if your relationship is so bad which it turned out it was like there was no correcting it it's time to find a new job I get it's not easy I don't want to dismiss how difficult it would be because I have never done that but to me the mental resilience part of when I feel weak when I don't feel good enough when how do I you know step into being the person being strong being confident being that person that can uh, withstand people like that it's to look at these moments and I go back to empowers me like it really does empower me to say I can open the door or I cannot open the door you're the gatekeeper yeah the gate I tell people like you got a gate open and close it at your will if the gate's wide open and anybody can come in and you're having all these issues close the fucking gate you own who comes through the gate and who doesn't you decide and you own when you open the gate and when you close it own your gate no disruptors are powerful you can use time and distance and space so that you can remove yourself from a situation this way you can release what you're feeling so that you don't exacerbate the situation by staying there different people use different disruptors so find the disruptors that work for you we'll see about that missy because video games and pink i'm not i'm not One of my favorite disruptors is hitting the gym. Nothing changes my mood faster than feeling like a freaking beast. And one of my favorite disruptors is racing. And dancing. Who doesn't feel better after blasting music and dancing and wiggling their little tish across the living room? Now, even though wiggling my tush works perfectly for me, it may not work for you. It's important to try a few different disruptors to figure out exactly what is your jam. Now, take a moment and think about what disruptors you can use in your life to help you. video games please <laughs> all right let's go thank you <laughs> my god that's your ship. why is it pink because it's my ship <laughs> click, 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 click. what yeah. does this do it does a double punch get him go get him <laughs> oh man <laughs> that's actually not true oh, shit, i forgot my line <laughs> It's one line, what Lisa. The funny thing is, like, I was like, "Fuck, what's my line? What, what is my line?" line? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not wearing pink. That was one time, and it was coral. I'm not wearing pink.